In our last week's halaqa, we had discussed uh, some of the stories of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, some of the final stories that we have before he became a prophet. And there are two incidents that we have left that we are going to discuss today of the pre-prophethood stories. And then we are done with all of the narrations of the pre-prophethood stories. And the fact of the matter, as I have said many, many times, is that we do not have most of the reports of the Prophet's early life. Uh, we have probably a dozen or so particular incidents, and that's about it for 40 years of his, of his uh, early life. And there are two incidents left that we need to discuss before the coming of the prophethood, before the beginning of the revelation. The first of these is his marriage to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And the marriage to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, how did the Prophet meet Khadija? How did this come about? As we had said in our last week's halaqa, that the Prophet was a shepherd. He was a shepherd and he would find people who owned flock and then he would take their flock and he would get some meager wages for this. Now it so happened that Khadija's older sister had a flock. She had a, uh, a herd of camels and her older sister hired the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to take their flock out and to uh, graze them outside of Mecca. And she hired two people. We don't have the name of the other person. The Prophet ﷺ and another young, another young man. The two of them were hired to become shepherds for her large flock. After the Prophet ﷺ had finished the grazing, they had to go back into town in order to collect their wages. You pay the wage, you pay, you pay the salary as soon as the wages are finished. So. The young man that was with the Prophet and at this age the Prophet is probably 23, 24 years old. The young man that was with him said, now that we're done, come let's go and ask our wages from uh, Khadija's sister. From Khadija's sister. Uh, according to some reports his name was Hala. Uh, so let us go ask our wages from Khadija's sister. So the Prophet said, why don't you go on my behalf because I am too shy to go because she's a woman. I'm too shy to go. And astahi, I have haya, I don't want to go ask her, why don't you go on my behalf and you get both of our wages for us. So uh, the person came to Khadija's sister and it so happened that Khadija was in her house at that time. And he asked for his wages. Khadija said, where is Muhammad? He also has earned half of the wage, where is Muhammad? So the man said, he was too shy to come and ask it from you. He was too shy to come and ask it from you. And so at this, Khadija's older sister said that I have not seen any man who is more shy and more noble and more honorable and more chaste in his interactions because she's interacting with him because she's a woman. So she knows he's lowering his gaze. He's acting in a very elegant manner. So she says, I have never seen any man more. And then she kept on praising the Prophet and uh, the narrator of this report says, this was the first time Khadija heard of his name in such a manner. And just like any human being, that when a person is praised in such a manner, something entered her heart. Because he's being praised in such a noble manner. And eventually, in later on in the year, Khadija had to send her own caravan to Syria. Remember we had said that there was the two journeys of Yemen and Syria and Khadija owned a lot of wealth. Let's pause here. Where did she get this wealth from? Uh, Khadija had been married twice up until that point in time. And her second husband was a wealthy merchant. And the two of them did not have any children. She had sons from the first marriage. But she didn't have sons from the second marriage. Now in Jahiliyyah, women did not inherit. That was the general rule. But in this marriage, this person did not leave any siblings and they didn't have any children. And so it became one of the rare opportunities that Khadija could inherit a lot of money. Otherwise, the general rule, women would not inherit money. So her second husband was a rich merchant and he didn't have any siblings. And so when he died, they didn't have any children, so then automatically it will go to Khadija. And so Khadija inherited a small fortune. And over the course of the next few years after her husband died, she kept on investing in that money. How would she invest? Just like we invest in our times, she would order some goods to be purchased in the time of Hajj and then send those goods to Syria 
purchase other goods from Syria, send them to Yemen, get other goods from Yemen, sell them in Makkah. This is what businessmen or businesswomen do. But because she's a woman, she cannot go herself to do it. And so every single time she has to hire a businessman. Now in those days, and this is still common in our times, but not as common, in those days, you wouldn't hire such a person by a wage. You wouldn't say, you go to Syria, I'll pay you a thousand dinars, and uh, you do X, Y, and Z. No. You would make it percentage profit. This is called mudaraba. You would give a percentage profit. And you would say, for example, that 30% of all the profit will be yours and 70% will be mine. Because I'm the one investing, you're the one doing the manual labor, right? And this type of uh, sharing of the profits is something our Sharia has definitely allowed and considered it to be a part and parcel of legitimate business transactions. So Khadija would engage in this mudaraba, this percentage. And of course, because she's sending a man who's not related to her, who's not looking after her best interests, usually the person she chose would steal and would lie and would cheat and would not give the whole hisab, the whole actual uh, account. And therefore, she never managed to get the type of wealth that she deserved. Still, she managed to maintain her dignity and maintain a good amount of wealth, but never as much as she actually uh, deserved. And she felt that she had earned it. So when she heard this praise about the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. She decided, why don't I choose this young man? Even though he was inexperienced when it comes to business, he had never ever gone on a business trip himself. He was a shepherd, sallallahu alayhi wa He was not somebody who was a businessman. But because of his honesty, she decided to overlook the lack of experience and also the lack of age. Generally, you would choose somebody in their 40s and their 50s, somebody who knows the caravan, the roots, everything. But she overlooked all of this because she wanted somebody honest. And subhanAllah, it is human nature that when a man is decent, is elegant with his interactions with a woman, then the rest of his nature is also good. That when a man treats a woman in this manner, this automatically he has uh, a characteristic that is noble. And automatically Khadija felt, this is a man I can trust. And I can send my caravan with him. And so, uh, the Prophet, so, so Khadija sent a message to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through one of her servants saying that uh, the, the lady Khadija, now Khadija of course at this time was well known because she was the richest lady in Mecca. She was not the richest person in Mecca, but she was the richest lady. Because no other woman, as we said, it's impossible for a woman to inherit, right? So because in this situation she inherited automatically, she has the most wealth out of all the women. And uh, she is also uh, single, and it was very rare for some, somebody to be single in that society. And this is something even Islam carried into it. You hardly find any of the Sahaba single. They would always marry, and it is something that they consider to be a part and parcel of living. You don't live a single life. Khadija, perhaps for whatever reason, she had been married twice. She felt that she wasn't suitable for anybody. She wasn't interested in anybody. So she had closed this door, and Ibn Ishaq and others, they mentioned that a number of men had tried to marry her, because she was of noble lineage and she was a pure Qurashi and they liked this and because she was a wealthy woman and of course every man would want that wealth because if he married Khadija that wealth would become his according to Jahili law. And so a lot of men proposed but Khadija turned all of them down because she didn't want to share this wealth. She didn't feel anybody would treat her the way that she deserved. So she sent a message to the Prophet why don't you take charge of my caravan. The Prophet went to Abu Talib and said, Oh my uncle, Khadija has sent me such and such an offer, what do you think? And this shows that he was a very respectful young man. That he didn't just impetuously say yes. He got permission, even though he doesn't need permission. He's a young man, he's independent. He doesn't need to ask his uncle. But he got permission from his uncle. And he said, Uncle, what do you think? And so, uh, Khadija, uh, the Abu Talib basically said that, uh, Oh my nephew, Khadija is well known to be the richest woman. And, you know, this is definitely much better than the job that you're doing now. It's, you're going to get, inshallah, good sustenance. Allah has blessed you with this opportunity. Do not say no to her. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said yes. And Khadija agreed that she would give half of the Prophets to the Prophet Sallallahu and she would keep half of the Prophets, which is a very generous share. But she felt that this was a man that if I give him a good incentive, he would, uh, inshaAllah Ta'ala, do a good uh, job. And so the Prophet Sallallahu accepted and Khadija sent one of her servants uh, along as well to him. And the Prophet Sallallahu took the caravan to the city of uh, Busra. 
B O S R A, not the Basra of uh, Iraq, and not the. There's another city that's very similar sounding in Turkey, Bursa. No, this is Basra in English. It's called Basra, and Basra is a small town uh, outside of Damascus, by at least uh, I think a hundred kilometers or so. It's it's towards the way to Damascus, but you don't haven't reached Damascus yet. It's on the periphery of the Roman Empire, and the Arabs would typically stop at Basra. They wouldn't go to Damascus. Basically, it's like coming to America. You just stop right at the border. Let's say Texas, right? And then you just do your buying good and sell because you don't want to go all the way inside. You're in the country, and this is the most convenient location. And Basra had a huge marketplace that was known just for this because it was at the periphery of uh, of the Arabs and the Nabataeans and other cultures uh, of, of, of the north. Uh, Egyptians would also be able to go there. Yemenis, they would all be able to go. To, so Basra, historically, not from the Islamic sources, from the non-Muslim sources, Basra is well known to have been a town of uh, economic transactions. And to this day, there are ruins in Basra of the marketplace of Basra that goes back to 1,500 years before the time of the Prophet And by the way, just as a tidbit as well, uh, so Umar conquered Basra in his caliphate and uh, before he conquered Damascus, on his way to conquering Damascus. And Umar built one of the first masjids ever built in what is now Syria. One of the first masjids ever built and it is still standing to this day and it is one of the oldest masajid in existence from its original uh, time. Even before the Grand Mosque of the Umayyad because of course the Umayyad Mosque was built much later. So this is a mosque Umar ibn Khattab built in Basra because for them Basra was more important than Damascus. But I wander to another tangent. Let's get back to the story of the Prophet with Khadija. So, uh, Khadija had sent her servant, the name is given is Maysara generally, uh, sent, uh, and when Maysara came back, so the Prophet went to Basra and then returned. He did not go to Damascus. When the Prophet came back, Maysara told Khadija of the uh, care and concern that the Prophet had shown, of his honesty. Some reports even mention the miracle of the cloud on top of his head. And this is not something that is strange. If it happened, it happened. But there's no authentic reports. And as I pointed out, uh, that we have to be a little bit careful about these things before the prophecy, because the question arises that if people had seen them before the prophecy, this would have been a clear sign that he's going to be a prophet, and th there are indications being given. Uh, nonetheless, it's something that has been narrated in some of the early books, that there was always a cloud above the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And the Prophet sallam, made double or triple, yani the Arabic says adhaf, which means many times more, the prophet that anybody else had made before him. Now this is of course for two reasons. Firstly because he's being honest and secondly because there's no question that whatever he does Allah will bless it. There's no question about that. Yani we go back to when he was an infant and a baby and Halima herself, her animal, her own breasts, everything was giving barakah. Just that the Prophet have entered their household and their camel becomes faster, their, their she goat be, get, be, uh, gives milk, etc, etc. And so there's no question that whatever the Prophet is doing is going to have extra blessings. So the, the caravan came back with adhaf, adhaf, yani multiple prophets that Khadija had never experienced uh, before. Now, this is now uh, increasing the emotions that Khadija has. And it is very clear, and some of us might feel awkward or hesitant to say this, but subhanAllah, firstly, it's narrated in the earliest books. Secondly, there's nothing wrong with feeling such emotions. It's completely permissible. She's a single lady. The Prophet is uh, an eligible bachelor. And uh, as I, I say many times to my students when I teach classes, uh, falling in love is not haram. It's what you do with that love that can make it haram or halal. Falling in love is a natural emotion. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And Khadija, there's no question that emotions came to her. That first she's hearing the process and being praised so highly by her own sister. And then she sees the honesty. And then she sees all, everything. Then Maysara comes and tells her everything that transpired. There's nothing wrong at all with her now having a desire to marry the Prophet Muhammad and subhanAllah, what lady would not have desired to marry the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The details differ about how the, uh, the uh, proposal came about, but they all agree about one thing. Khadija was the one who instigated it. Khadija was the one who hinted at it or who kind of sort of arranged for the Prophet to, to, to propose. Now obviously the way that proposals happen, the man proposes for the woman. However, 
if the woman expresses an interest, then this is something that is permissible with conditions. And of course, the man is up to the man to then eventually propose, even in Islam. Even in Islam, if this happens with certain guidelines, uh, then of course, this is completely permissible. And so Khadija, uh, in one version, uh, Khadija told uh, a friend, or, or it says another servant of hers who was a, an elderly lady by the name of Nafisa, it is said, uh, that she expressed, uh, she expressed an interest in marrying the Prophet ﷺ. And so Nafisa said, leave this to me, I will arrange it. And so she visited the Prophet ﷺ, and she was an elderly lady, and she said that, O oh Muhammad ﷺ, again he's not a prophet at this time, O oh Muhammad ﷺ, why don't you get married? So the Prophet ﷺ smiled and said, and who would marry me? Because I am the orphan, poor person of the Quraysh. I'm an orphan and I'm poor. Who's going to marry me? And so uh, Nafisa said, what if Khadija wanted to marry you? What if Khadija? So she's not saying Khadija is sending me, but it's there. What if my master, what if my friend Khadija wanted to marry you? And the Prophet was quiet and then he said, why would she want me? Notice he didn't say, I'm not interested in her. He's wondering, why would she want me? So the message is given that he is interested. Because she didn't say, he didn't say, no, I'm not interested in her. Rather, he's thinking, why would she want somebody like me? Because he considered himself to be uh, uh, not somebody that was uh, worthwhile. But subhanAllah, he is Rasulullah. And he was going to be Rasulullah. And he is definitely uh, the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen for uh, Khadija. And so Nafisa went back and told uh, Khadija, and there the matter then went to stage two. And uh, there are a number of uh, versions of how this took place as well. Uh, Ibn Ishaq says, by the way, that this marriage took place in the month of Safar. In the month of Safar, three months after he returned from Basra. Three months after the journey. So for three months there was this back and forth. There are two versions of this story. In my previous classes, I never mentioned the second one, but uh, some people mentioned this second version, and therefore I feel compelled to mention it just to point out that it is not authentic. Otherwise, I would prefer not to mention this. And in my previous classes, I would not have, I never mentioned this in the many times that I taught the seerah. But there is one version with a very weak chain that Khadija's father was alive at the time, and he opposed the marriage. And so he was caused to become drunk and it was made to appear to him or he was convinced that the marriage had taken place and so when he became sober again it was too late to say no. And there are more details that I'm not going into but uh, it is not something that is uh, a very nice story to be honest and then we find it to be uh, contradicted by a number of other facts. First and foremost Ibn Hajar and others point out that Khadija's father had died. Khadija's father had died before uh, this proposal had happened. And so she didn't have a father at the time. And this makes sense because if her father had been alive, then he would have taken the money. Because a woman will not take the money if she has a father or a uh, brother or a husband. So uh, the, the stronger position is that her father was not alive at all. Additionally, there is another version which is reported by more books than this one book that mentions this version. And I pause here and I point out that, as I have said before, there are a number of books about the seerah written in the first two, three hundred years. And we go back to these earliest books. Many of them are without chains of narrations. Because these are just stories that they collected. And nobody knows who narrated these stories. So sometimes these stories, there might have been such a story, it happened to somebody else. But some narrator got confused and he said, maybe it happened with Muhammad Sassam and Khadija, right? Maybe it happened to some Jahili person. So these are stories or legends that have been passed down. It's very crucial that we look at them and then sift through which are authentic, which are not. So the more authentic version mentions that her uncle Amr ibn Asad was the one who performed the nikah. And there was no issue of alcohol or, or being sober or drunk, nothing like this. This is not a story that is true with Khadija's father. That her Khadija's father was not alive, that her uncle Amr ibn Asad became her wali, and Abu Talib came with the Prophet ﷺ, and Abu Talib performed the khutbah. He performed the sermon. And the sermon is recorded in one of the early books that Abu Talib began by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then talking about the lineage of the Quraysh, that's what they always talked about, that we are the noble descendants of Ibrahim and Ismail, that Allah has blessed us with this and this, and that of the blessings we have is that we have the, we are the, care, the caretakers of the Kaaba, and Allah has blessed us to be the people of Mecca, and my nephew, 
the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my nephew is the one who is no comparison with any other young man in all of Mecca, in his manners and his nobility and his lineage. And he has proposed to your noble lady, Al Karima, your noble daughter, your noble lady, Khadija, with a mahar of 12 uqiyah, uh, uqiya is a nugget of silver. So 12 nuggets of silver with a little bit of uh, coins of silver as well. This is a modest amount. Um, I, I don't want to give you any, any, any precise figure, but we can say uh, a ballpark figure of a few hundred dollars in our times would be. It's not a massive amount and it's not a token figure of a dollar or two. Yeah, and it's something that we would consider $400, $500. It's an amount that is a respectful amount for somebody like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so he gave the khutbah at this Amr, uh, Khadija's uncle stood up and said, this is a young man who cannot be refused. We accept the proposal. And we had already said that Khadija had been married twice before. From her first marriage, she had a son named Hala. Now, Hala is commonly in our times a girl's name. But in those days, Hala was more of a boy's name. In our times, it's become more of a girl's name. So don't get confused. Hala is a male. Hala is Khadija's son. And Hala, uh, Hala accepted Islam eventually and lived a noble life uh, with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now the question arises, how old was Khadija at the time of her marriage? The common opinion that everybody is aware of is that she was 40 years old when she was married. And this is the opinion of one of the classical scholars of Islam, his name is Al-Waqidi. Al-Waqidi says she was 40 years when she was married and she died when she was 65 because everybody agrees that they were married for 25 years. And everybody agrees that the Prophet was 25 years old. Well, not everybody, one or two say he was 24 and 23, but around this age, 25 years old when he got married. However, and this is the common well-known age that people have. However, there are more authentic reports that her age was not 40. And I know this is not common knowledge to the most of you, but academically speaking, uh, there are two problems with this age. Firstly, Al-Waqidi is not to the caliber of those who report a different age. Al-Waqidi is much lower in the scale. And so we have people like Al-Bayhaqi, and Ibn Kathir, the famous scholar Ibn Kathir, who wrote the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, and, uh, uh, and, and others, a report that she died when she was around 50 years old. So if she died when she was around 50, this changes everything. In her 50s, they say. Fil khamsina, she was in her 50s. This changes everything. Another early authority, and his name is Hisham al-Kalbi, uh, says that Khadija married when she was 28 years old. And we have from Al-Hakim, who wrote a book called Al-Mustadrak, which was one of the books of Hadith, he reports from the famous Ibn Ishaq, who is the earliest author of the seerah, Ibn Ishaq, the famous seerah Ibn Ishaq, that Ibn Ishaq says that she was 28 years old. Now, this appears to be more valid for two reasons. Number one, because the people who are reporting 28 are more in quantity and in quality, i.e. they are more knowledgeable. Ibn Ishaq is the authority of Sirah. Nobody is more authoritative than him. And Ibn Ishaq is reporting that she was 28. Uh, additionally, Hisham al-Kalbi. Additionally, al-Bayhaqi says she died when she was in her 50s. That means she was 28 when she, around that age when she got married. But then the second point is even more clear. The Prophet and Khadija had at least six children, maybe more. And a woman in her 40s, it is very difficult to imagine her having six children. Whereas a woman who is 28, it is much more logical and rational and in fact perfect. Six children at the age of 28 in those days is something that is very reasonable. A child every year and a half, every two years, very reasonable. Uh, so for 12 years she's having children, so she's having children she's, till she's around 40. And this makes a lot more sense than to say that she was 40 when she got uh, married. And uh, academically speaking, it does seem to be the more correct opinion that uh, she was 28 years old. Now, some of the points here that we can derive before we move on about the, the, other, the, 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 the last incident before the marriage, or sorry, before the prophethood. Some of the blessings 
some of the morals of the story with Khadija. First and foremost, it shows the importance of honesty and of good etiquette, of good akhlaq. <laughs> honesty is appreciated by everybody in mankind and it brings about blessings. Because the Prophet was honest as a shepherd, shy as a, 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 a worker at a very menial job, that shyness and honesty upgraded his position in pay rank. Right? This is what happened. That he was honest, he was trustworthy, and he was humble, modest. He had good qualities. What happened? Automatically, opportunities were created that gave him more and more uh, higher positions. And this is the reality of the dunya. That if you show your character, character counts a lot, much more even than experience. Because Khadija overlooked his zero experience. He has no experience. Khadija overlooked all of that and hired him to become uh, one of the highest paid uh, businessmen in all of Mecca, uh, taking the caravan to to Basra. It also shows the intelligence and status of Khadija because she saw the Prophet as being an ideal and perfect husband. And as we said, this clearly shows the permissibility of uh, not just natural feelings of desire and attraction, but of even pursuing that in a permissible manner. As I said previously, uh, it is not haram to be in love, it is halal to be in love, it's what you do with it, right? It is what you do with it. So Khadija had feelings and she pursued it in a legitimate manner. And that legitimate manner was the manner of uh, marriage. Uh, also, the Prophet wasallam needed support and comfort for his future mission. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for him a woman who would give him that support and comfort. And as we uh, all know and we say, and it is so true, that behind every successful man there is a... There is a good woman. This is the fact of life. And this is something that every single person acknowledges. Men can pretend to be macho and strong and, and whatnot. But the fact of the matter is they need a loving, uh, supporting woman in their lives. This is the reality that Allah created men like this. That in public they can put on this, this persona. But in private, they need the comfort and the support of a loving wife. Otherwise, it's very difficult, if not impossible. And our Prophet wasallam, Allah chose for him Khadija to be that loving and that comforting wife. And uh, this is something, inshallah, we'll talk about more later on. Uh, the blessings of Khadija are simply too numerous to mention. She was the first to believe in the Prophet ﷺ. She comfort, comforted him as soon as the revelation began. She was the one who thought, let's take him to Waraqa ibn Nawfal. Let's take him to somebody who knows what's going on and ask what is happening. Uh, she was the only one whom Jibreel would come in the household of Khadija. He would not enter any other household, any other wife's house. Any other wife's house he would not enter later on. Aisha, Umm Salama, no one. He only entered the house of Khadija. And uh, Jibreel told the Prophet ﷺ, once when the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in Mecca, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said to Khadija that, Oh Khadija, here is Jibreel. Because Jibreel would enter and Khadija was in the house, the only wife he would enter. Here is Jibreel and he is sending Allah's salam upon you, subhanAllah. He is sending Allah's salam upon you and He is giving you the glad tidings of a house in Jannah where there is not going to be any noise and any struggling. You will have peace in that household. And so Khadija responded that, Inna Allah huwa salam. She didn't say, Wa alayka salam, ya Allah, because you don't say, Wa alayka salam, ya Allah. Allah is a salam. And this really shows her intelligence. It really shows her understanding of theology of Islam. That when Allah is sending salam to Khadija, what is the response? You don't say, Wa alayka salam, ya Allah. You don't say that, right? And I've heard a lot of people, when something good happens, they'll say, Jazakallah, Allah. You don't say, Jazakallah to Allah. Allah's jaza comes to you. You, you are nobody to give jaza back to Allah. It's a big mistake, even though they do it innocently. You don't give jaza back to Allah. You don't send salam back to Allah. You don't say, Wa alayka salam, ya Allah. Allah is a salam. This is Khadija's response. Automatically, she understood. Inna Allah huwa salam. I can't send salam back to Allah. Allah is a salam. Wa ala Jibreel as salam. And may salam be upon Jibreel. Wa alayka ya Rasulullah as salam. And may salam be upon you ya Rasulullah. This was Khadija's uh, response. And Aisha, who was no doubt the favorite wife of the Prophet in the Medinan phase, of course at this phase Aisha is not even born. 
She's not even born right now when the Prophet marries Khadija. And so Aisha never saw Khadija. Never. And yet Aisha says that I was never more jealous of any woman than I was of Khadija. Even though the Prophet had married eventually nine wives and Aisha was one of the nine. And she was jealous of those nine, no doubt about it. There are instances who have of the seerah that she says things and does things that shows her jealousy. But she says, I never felt the amount of jealousy I did for Khadija, even though I never saw her. Even though I never saw her. Why? Because I knew how much the Prophet loved her. I could say, and she's a woman, she's not, she's a wife, she knows how much the Prophet loved her. I knew it, so I was the most jealous of Khadija. And once when the Prophet was mentioning Khadija, he said, I had enough of it. That was it. And so I said, Ya Rasulallah, for how long are you going to mention, and then she said things you shouldn't have said, an old toothless lady. Yani, you know, she's like an old lady, right? Uh, and she said, you know, things, yani, uh, basically an old uh, lady like this, when Allah has given you a young fertile ground instead. Right? In other words, I am a young lady and I'm fertile ground. And how long are you going to mention this toothless yani, lady like this? And so she said in a manner that uh, only a woman can say. And <laughs> the Prophet wasallam got irritated at this. And he said, La wallahi, no by Allah. And because Aisha is saying that I'm better than Khadija, basically. No by Allah. Allah did not give me better than her. If you really want to know, you're getting me irritated, I will tell you. He didn't say that phrase, I'm adding it. But he said, no by Allah, Allah did not give me better than her. She was the first to believe in me when everybody rejected me. Meaning, Aisha, you don't have that blessing. She was the first to believe in me when everybody rejected me. And she gave me of her money when everybody had abandoned me. She was the one spending on the process when everybody else had abandoned him. And she supported me when the community basically gave me the cold shoulder. And Allah blessed me with children only through her. He ascribed this to Allah because Allah is the one who blesses you, not my, it's not Khadija's or mine. So he says, and Allah has razaqani, Allah has blessed me with children only through her. None of my other wives Allah has chosen with this uh, blessing. And so, after this, Aisha learned her lesson and said, I never mentioned her again. <laughs> never mentioned her again. Because of this uh, uh, jealousy that the Prophet ﷺ had. And subhanAllah, uh, yani, and, and one of the reasons why Aisha was jealous, whenever the Prophet ﷺ got a gift, when he got money, when he got meat even, because meat was a luxury item, he would cut some of the meat and he would send it to, this is in Medina, way later on, 10 years later, he would send it to Khadija's friends. Can you imagine? Like how much you're thinking of your dead wife, that Khadija has passed away, but you want to give some meat to the friends she was socialized with. The friends she was socialized with. And once Khadija's older sister came to Medina, this is the same one that introduced, the same one that praised him, right? And Aisha was in the house. And subhanAllah, this is such a beautiful story that when, uh, when the, the sister was walking outside the door, the Prophet's demeanor changed because he recognized Khadija's footstep. And when she asked permission for enter, Aisha could see the paleness on her face because, on his face, because all the memories of Khadija came back. Because this was the wife that he knew it was, he knew it was her older sister, but the memories of Khadija were so strong that so many years later still uh, he would be moved to tears almost. Uh, and uh, when Khadija passed away, uh, one of the Sahaba says, we did not see him smile for months. We did not see him smile for months. And it was such a, a big loss for the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And we can go on and on about the, the blessings of Khadija. Uh, we mentioned that Khadija was most likely 28 years old. This doesn't change the fact, we always like to say that the process of marrying somebody older, twice divorced with children. It's still the same. That she was older. She was twice divorced. She had a child. So this clearly shows that the Prophet wasallam is not a, a lustful man. That if he wanted to, he could have married a younger lady without children who had never been married a virgin. He, if he wanted to, he could have done that. But he married somebody of nobility, somebody who was twice divorced with children and remained faithful to her until Khadija passed away. He never took another wife until Khadija passed away. And then one after the other, he started marrying.
And so he wasn't marrying for lustful reasons. Because he's marrying when he's past 54 years old, he begins to marry uh, the nine wives. For until he's 54, from 25 up until the age of 54 or so, if not 55, because Aisha uh, uh, probably was when he was 55 years old or so. So uh, the Prophet is remaining basically loyal to Khadija for all of these years. And this clearly shows that he was not a man who was lustful, that he could control his desires, that this was not what he had in mind by marrying somebody like uh, Khadija. And uh, this also demonstrates uh, as well, or sorry, the, the one point I forgot to mention. I already said this, that all of the children of the Prophet were through Khadija. We said that there were at least six children. The reason why at least six the first child of the Prophet you should all know his name, it is Al-Qasim. And Al-Qasim, the Prophet's kunya was Abu Al-Qasim. That's his first child. His kunya is Abu Al-Qasim. Al-Qasim, it is said that he was born in the days of Jahiliyyah. He was born before the Wahi began. He was born before the Wahi began. It is said that Al-Qasim had reached the age where the boys could ride on the camel. Six, seven, eight years old. And then he passed away. That's all that we have in It's the only thing we know about him. Not one story has been preserved. But six, seven, eight years old before he passed away. And then the Prophet ﷺ had Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima, the youngest daughter. Four daughters. Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima. And then he had his final son with Khadija, and that is Abdullah. Now, some people say he also had a tahir and a tayyib. And so they add two more to make it eight. However, the strongest position is that Abdullah had two nicknames, a tahir and a tayyib. And so a tahir and a tayyib is Abdullah. And a tahir means the pure one, uh, and a tayyib also means the pure one. And this is what the nicknames they would have for their child. And uh, Abdullah died in infancy without even in Islam. He was born after the Wahi and he died in Islam. Of course, the four daughters, all of them lived to maturity. All of them married. Uh, and the only and the three of them died in his own lifetime. So he saw Salaam, buried his own daughters with his hands. The three daughters he buried with his own hands. Only Fatima outlived him. And even Fatima on his deathbed. He told Fatima something and she cried. And when he saw her crying, this is his daughter and he loves his daughter like only a father can love a daughter. He calls his daughter again and he whispers something and she laughs. Many, many months later, Aisha asked Fatima, can you tell me that conversation? I want to know. And so Fatima confessed and she said, my father told me that he's about to die and I couldn't bear except to cry. So when he saw me crying, he called me and he said, you will be the first of my family to meet me. Meaning you're going to die soon. So I laughed, subhanAllah. I laughed because I'm going to meet the Prophet the first. And Fatima only lived a few months after the Prophet before she passed away as well. Now, it is interesting to comment here, and perhaps maybe we'll go back to this later on, but it's interesting to comment here, subhanAllah, the Prophet it is as if he is facing the most traumatic Problems after problems. Because the most traumatic thing that can happen to a child is to lose parents. And the most traumatic thing that can happen to a parent is to lose the child. Isn't that the case, right? I mean, there is no musiba on earth that is more painful than these two. There is no musiba. Wallahi, there is no musiba. And we as parents know this, that there is nothing that is more painful to us than to lose a child. And as a child, the most painful and dreadful thing, and this is something we have forgotten that phase of our younger lives, but the fact of the matter is, subhanAllah, look at what happens when a four or five year old loses their parents in the supermarket. What happens? They go crazy and wild that they cannot see their parents because they get so worried. Because there is nothing more conceivably you know, dramatic or, or, or disaster for this child than to lose the ones that love and take care of this child. Right? Our Prophet is multiple times orphaned. Father, then mother, then grandfather, then uncle, one after the other. And he's multiple times losing his own children. 
First the eldest, Al-Qasim, and then Abdullah, and then of course he has Ibrahim. Now Ibrahim, by the way, was not born of his wife, it was born of his maidservant, his Emma. And so none of his wives gave birth. Emma is different, fiqh-wise, and that's maybe we'll talk about it in its time. None of the other wives of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, became pregnant other than Khadija. So it is as if Allah is giving him the most difficult tragedies that is imaginable. And in this, wallahi, is great wisdom. It is as if Allah is telling him that your purpose in life is to be afflicted, that this life is nothing but suffering, that even the greatest human being is not going to live a comfortable life in this world. In fact, because he is the greatest, he will suffer like no one else is suffering. Because it is through these trials that so many things happen. First and foremost, one's relationship with Allah is established. SubhanAllah, how true is it? When we live comfortable lives, our hearts become hard. Isn't that the case? When money is pouring in, health is good, wealth is good, ah, who cares? Pray regularly, make dua on and off. Soon as your son falls ill, soon as you lose your job, soon as a musibah happens, what happens? The hands go up, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Isn't this the case, right? And Allah knows this. And living it in through these trials, it makes a person's heart closer to Allah. It's automatic. And the process of needed to have this closeness to Allah. Also living through these trials and afflictions, true servitude is reached. That you understand who you are and who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Living through these trials and afflictions gives you patience. And you will need patience if you're going to be the Prophet of Allah. You will need to have the utmost patience. And so he is afflicted with the greatest calamities to bring about that uh, patience. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, tested him through these hardships because by these hardships your own heart becomes soft. Subhanallah. When you've lived in poverty, when you've lived in poverty, then you will feel something for those who are poor. It's nature, human nature. And when you've lived in opulence and luxury, you don't connect with the rich, you don't with the poor, you don't connect with them at all. It is not a coincidence that our Prophet has so many a hadith about taking care of the orphan. He knows how it feels. There is a hadith that even says, if you can't give money to the orphan, at least rub his hair and make dua, be gentle with him. Because he knows what it is to be an orphan. He knows what it is. And so the, the, the commandment comes that at least Rub the hair, meaning you show some tenderness to the orphan. So Allah chose these trials upon the Prophet ﷺ so that when he grows older, he can bear his own trials and then he can be a merciful person. Because through trials, you develop your own uh, mercy. And even though Allah tried him, still Allah didn't try him beyond his capacity. Allah blessed him with both sons and daughters to give him a taste of fatherhood. And to silence those who try to mock him. Because if he didn't have any children, subhanAllah, people could have said very vulgar things about him. But Allah blessed him with both sons and with daughters. Even though Allah took the sons away. And subhanAllah, when he took the son away, um, you, this is, uh, I gave this halaqa before the tafsir of Surah Al-Kawthar. Inna a'tinaka al-Kawthar. Fasalil bik wanhar inna shanika huwa al-abtar. When Abdullah died, right, Abdullah was his youngest son. Abdullah was his youngest child. When Abdullah died, astaghfirullah, how crude and how callous. Abu Jahl runs through Mecca, cheering for joy. That قَدْ بَتَرَ مُحَمَّدٌ قَدْ بَتَرَ مُحَمَّد That he's so happy that the Prophet's son has died. That his progeny has cut off because the Arabs, everything is male children for them. Everything is male children. And if you don't have a male child, then you might as well be sterile. You might as well have nothing. And so he's running through Mecca that قَدْ بَتَرَ مُحَمَّدْ قَدْ بَتَرَ مُحَمَّدْ That his progeny has been cut off. His progeny has been cut off. And can you imagine your son has just died? Wallahi, only parents understand the possibility of that pain. And on top of that, your worst enemy is running through the town crying for joy. How much pain and grief that would have brought to our Prophet ﷺ. And Allah revealed three surahs, three, three ayat that were more beloved to the Prophet ﷺ than this whole world and all that it contained. <laughs> we have given you plenty. Don't worry. We have taken away one thing. We've given you al-kawthar. And al-kawthar is 
many things that we explained. Al Kothar is the paradise. Al Kothar is everything in paradise. Al Kothar is the river of paradise. In the Al Kothar, Fasalli Rabbika Wanhar, pray to Allah, sacrifice to Him. Those who oppose you, they will be the ones who are cut off from everything. In the Shani'aka Hu Al Abtar, those who follow you will flourish. You will be Warafa'na Laka Dikrak. You will be the one whose rank has been raised. Your opponents will be those who are cut off from all good. And as I pointed out, the only people who mention Abu Jahl's name and Abu Lahab's name are those who despise and hate them. What a legacy is this? What a legacy. The only people in the world who know them are those who hate and despise them. Us Muslims. That we, we want nothing to do with them. What a legacy have they left. Inna shani'aka huwal abitar. And uh, there are also wisdoms that uh, the Prophet was not allowed to have sons, by the way. This is a theological issue. That later on in life, when the Prophet had Ibrahim, he had Ibrahim when he was around uh, 59 years old, 59 or 60 years old. He had Ibrahim much later in his life. And Ibrahim lived for a year and a half, 18 months. And for those of us who are parents, you know that this is the sweetest age of children. Because then the terrible twos begin after that, right? The most tender age for children, the most love that you can have is really at this tender age. Well, they're a year and a half. And Allah blessed him with this because it's still such a blessing to be a father. And it's such a blessing to have a child to play with. But Allah knew that he could not be a father uh, for, for long term. And so Allah caused Ibrahim as well to pass on to the next world. And the Prophet was greatly grieved and he was crying. And in one hadith in Ibn Majah he said, listen to this, a lot of Muslims don't know this hadith. Uh, the Prophet said that had Ibrahim lived he would have been a prophet. It's not possible that the son of Rasulullah not be a prophet. It's not possible. Had Ibrahim lived, he would have been a Nabi. But you're, there is going to be no Nabi after me. And so Allah had to seal the prophecy. The Prophet knew this. And so this is a theological reason as well that the Prophet cannot have sons and he can only have daughters. And I have to add here as well, what a fitna it was for the Ummah that his daughters had sons after. And what did our Ummah do with those sons? And what groups were formed exaggerating the status of those grandchildren through women? Imagine if there was a male progeny. Wallahi, groups have taken this male progeny from a f woman, Fatima, and made them to be what they have made them. If there was a male progeny of the Prophet directly, the Ummah would have made them into prophets and gods walking on the earth. And it is a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he knew the weakness. And so he just cut it off. Because the Prophet's son would have been a prophet, so he's not going to have any sons that grow to uh, maturity. Uh, the last incident that uh, we have mentioned is the incident of the building of the Kaaba. The building of the Kaaba. The story is well known to you. And it was that the Prophet ﷺ was around 35 years old. Ibn Ishaq says he was 35 years old. So there are 10 years of marriage to Khadija. We don't even have one narration about what happens. SubhanAllah. And as I said, such a big loss, but we put our trust in Allah that these details would not have benefited us theologically. Allah knows what He preserved for us. So the next story we have is 10 years down the line, when the Prophet is 35 years old. The rebuilding of the Kaaba, the story is known to all of you, but some details maybe uh, you don't know. The Kaaba was damaged by two things in the year before it was rebuilt. The first a fire, the second a flood. SubhanAllah, fire and flood, two opposites. And what happened was a woman was cooking close to the Kaaba. Now you have to realize in our times the Kaaba is separated from settlements by hundreds of meters, thousands of feet. In those days, the houses of the people were literally 5-10 feet away from the Kaaba. You didn't need large tawaf gaps because you didn't have tens of thousands of people or millions of people coming. And even some of you might even remember in the 70s maybe, you know, some of you might even remember there were houses outside of Safa and Marwa. Do you remember that? I think you might remember outside of Safa and Marwa. Uh, there were houses literally, uh, people would be living there. This is in the early 70s. And Safa and Marwa was disconnected from the Haram. That's how small the Haram was, that you'd have to walk outside the, 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 the round haram, outside the Kaaba area, you would walk, you would exit the haram and then re-enter the Safa Marwa area, right? Because Mecca was a small city 
And so you can imagine the houses were very close. So a lady was cooking outside of her house close to the Kaaba and one of the embers sparked and it uh, set the uh, ghilaf or the, 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 the cloth of the Kaaba ablaze. The Kaaba was always clothed from the days of Jahiliya. They put, put, put a cloth on it. And so uh, the fire set the whole Kaaba ablaze. By the time they put the, the fire out, the Kaaba was damaged but not destroyed. It was weakened but not destroyed. Later on in the year, a massive flood came to Mecca. Now, Mecca is in the basin of a lot of mountains. And once every 10 years or so, there is a massive flood. I have witnessed this myself in one of the hajjahs that I have done. Unbelievable to see this. Literally, I was witness and I did that hajj that year. I swear by Allah, I was walking from Mina to, to the Kaaba because there were, the buses were all khalas, gone. I swear by Allah, there were points that the water was up until here. And this is on the streets of Mecca. Not even, and I'm walking with my bags on top of me like this. I'm sometimes up to here. There are pictures of a flood that happened in 1947 or so, 1948, where the people are swimming for tawaf. MashaAllah, good, good exercise, right? They're swimming for tawaf because the Kaaba was flooded. Now in our times, the Kaaba cannot be flooded unless Allah wills a major disaster. But the Kaaba cannot be flooded because they have, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, waterways and gutters to take rid of it. But the streets of Mecca flood still to this day. And I've witnessed this myself. The the point being, in that year, that flood happened. And the flood destroyed the roof of the Kaaba with all of the water, and it destroyed some of the walls of the Kaaba. So it's partially destroyed and not fully. And so they decided that they need to rebuild the entire Kaaba. Both damages had done. The fire weakened it, and then the flood pretty much destroyed the structure, even leaving some remnants here and there. Now, it so happened that when the Kaaba was destroyed, there was a news of a sale going on in the city of Jeddah. At the time, they called it Juddah. They called it Juddah. Jeddah is the modern name. Juddah. And what had happened was that the Caesar of Rome had sent supplies to one of the cities of Yemen to build a massive church over there. The Persians had destroyed it. The Persians are fire worshippers. The Romans are Christians. So as you know, there's a war going on. So as part of that war, the Persians had destroyed a church in Yemen. And so the Caesar, from his own money, decided to finance the rebuilding of that church. So he got the best wood and the best marble and the best uh, uh, craftsmen to go and build that church in Yemen. But Allah had another plan. And so, uh, uh, the, the, the books of Sirah mention that Allah sent a wind off the coast of Judah to cause the ship to basically crash. And the ship was damaged, but it just made it to Judah because Allah has a plan. It didn't drown. It made it to Judah. And when it made it to Judah, all of the cargo that the Caesar has, the most expensive marble and the grand, grandest wood. Now, Arabia has no marble. Right? There is no fancy wood. It's a desert. You don't get fancy wood in Arabia. Right? They don't have these building structures. They don't have craftsmen to that caliber. And Allah had willed that this is going to happen. And so they set up the merchandise for sale. And it was at this time, because they have to get back to Rome now. The ship is not going to get to Yemen. So they need to get money to get back to Rome. So forget this batch, we'll get another batch, right? So they set all of this merchandise, the marble and the, the fancy wood and everything. And there was also a najar, a craftsman basically, a carpenter or a craftsman with the ship. And so the Quraysh, when they heard about this, they gathered together all their wealth and they went to Mecca to purchase all, uh, to Jeddah, sorry, to Judah, to purchase all of this and to hire the craftsmen as well to come. And this is now a craftsman that has been educated in the palaces of the Caesar. You're not going to get a more qualified person on the face of the earth. How he ended up in Mecca, look, Allah Azza wa has a plan. SubhanAllah. Wallah, it's amazing when you think about it, right? How he ended up in Mecca with this fancy material, the, the choicest wood, the marble that the people in Mecca had never seen. Right? This is not what they're used to and accustomed to. So they come together and they purchase all of these goods and they bring them back to Mecca. And this is the miracles of Allah that happened. When they purchased all of these goods, now... 
They're wondering now, the Kaaba is in semi-destroyed state in front of them, and they're wondering, should we come and destroy it? This is the house of Allah. They've never uh, destroyed the house of Allah before. I mean, even the thought of it is sacrilegious, right? They don't know what to do. And according to one report of Ibn Ishaq mentions this, that uh, when they were debating what to do, a large snake came out of the well of Zamzam. And it was rumored that there was a snake living in the well of Zamzam. Now this large snake came out, massive snake, and any time they approached it, hissed at them. And so they wondered, what are they supposed to do? And Allah sent a big bird to pick up the snake and to get rid of it, to throw it behind one of the mountains of Mecca. So they took this as a sign that they should approach the Kaaba. That the snake is not guarding the Kaaba anymore. That we can now go and approach the Kaaba. But they're still terrified. And so they're, each one is nudging the other for, why don't you go first? Why don't you go first? Because they're worried what's going to happen. Until finally, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, and he is uh, the nobleman that Allah mentions in the Quran, Dharni wa man khalaqtu wahida. Uh, this is Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. And he was their poet and their nobleman. And he became an enemy of the Prophet But he was a nobleman of the Quraysh at the time. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira finally said, Khalas, I'm going to do it. Hand me the axe. So he took the axe and... He marched towards the Kaaba and he started breaking down one of the walls of the Kaaba. Nobody lifted a finger to help. Then the rumor spread. Why don't we use Al Walid as the litmus test? If he survives the night, <laughs> we'll join him the next day. And if something happens to him, then, well, you know, khalas is a good riddance, one person less to worry about, right? So, they basically did not help him that day. And he did his own job as much as he could. Then the next morning, he woke up fine and healthy. Everything's fine. So they said, okay, alhamdulillah, khalas. In fact, Al-Walid, when he approached the Kaaba, uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions that. Now, these are pagans. They're not Muslims. So Ibn Ishaq mentions he lifted the axe and he said, Oh Allah, don't get alarmed. Don't get angry. We're just trying to help the Kaaba. I mean, he's this jahidi mentality. He doesn't understand. You know, Allah knows his thoughts, right? But he's trying to say, don't get alarmed, O Allah, and don't get angry. We're just trying to help rebuild the Kaaba. And so Al-Walid uh, put one wall down. And so the next day, Alhamdulillah, the entire Quraysh decided now we all have to tear the Kaaba down and then rebuild it. And what they did was they divided all of the tribes into four groups. All of the sub-tribes of the Quraysh. The Quraysh have many sub-tribes, right? So they gathered together and they divided all of these tribes into four groups. Each of the tribes gets one wall, right? Not each of the tribes because there was more than four. But basically, group, tribes are grouped together based on their lineage. The closest tribes together, you get this wall. Another close group, you get this wall. And the... Banu Abd Manaf, which is the great sub-tribe of the Banu Hashim, right? This is confusing, I don't want to confuse you guys too much, but the Banu Hashim is one of the tribes of the Banu Abd Manaf. The Banu Abd Manaf is one of the tribes of the Quraysh. So it goes like lineage, like you just keep on making it bigger and bigger. The Banu Abd Manaf is the, 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 the branch that contains the Banu Hashim. So the Banu Abd Manaf is given the most prestigious, and that's the side of the wall. Why? Because they are the most prestigious. They knew it. Abdul Muttalib was from them. And Abdul Muttalib was he, who he was. So they get the most prestigious. The second most prestigious, the Banu Makhzum. Abu Jahl is from this tribe. right? The Banu Makhzum, they get the wall that is the Rukn Yamani to the Black Stone. Right? You guys following here? Right? The last fourth of the Kaaba. So they get the second most prestigious wall. And then their other tribes, we don't have to mention their names, they get the, the other two walls. Now, you all know what happened. The Banu Abd Manaf and the Banu Makhzum are raising the corner that has the black stone, right? The black stone doesn't belong to either wall, it belongs to both. Right? And so when they get to that area, trouble brews. Why? Because the Banu Makhzum and the Banu Abd Manaf are rivals. They remained rivals. And they continue to be rivals even after Islam, by the way. The Umayyads and the Abbas and whatnot, it continued. Because the Umayyads go back to the, this, this branch. So, uh, so both of them said, put their foots down. They said, the black stone is my side. No, it's my side. Right? And then the other tribes also put in and said, why should you get the privilege? This is a special stone. Now the Arabs knew that the black stone was a special stone, even in the days pre-Islam. And the... Uh, the, 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 the fighting between them or the, the rhetoric or the anger reached such a level that construction on the Kaaba stopped for five days. They reached the level of the black stone and just stopped. 
because they needed to resolve who is going to put the black stone in. So can you imagine for five days heated arguments, they almost came to blows. The Banu Makhzum secretly put together a, uh, an agreement with some other sub-tribes that they would fight to death to put the black stone in. And they dipped their hands in blood because they couldn't sign. So they got some camel blood, they dipped their hands in the blood. So this is how they would sign things. Like in the Hilf al Mutayyibin, what did they dip it in? Perfume. perfume. So they would dip their hands in blood. So they secretly dipped their hands in blood. And they made a secret pact for the Banu Makhzum that no way we're going to allow anybody to put the black stone except us, even if we die to the last man. Wallahi, what jahiliyyah. I mean, you're going to kill yourself and leave your wife, you know, a widow, and leave your children an orphan. Because of the honor of later on Jahili Arabs, what would they say? That we allowed the, 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 the Banu Abd. And these are your cousins. Like the Banu Abd Manaf and the Banu Makhzum are cousins back in the day. Obviously, that's the whole point. They all go back to the Quran. This is what you call tribalism, gang mentality. Right? This is Jahiliyyah. So, they were almost about to reach to blows. On the fifth day, they all came together. And Abu Umayyah ibn al-Mughira, who was the oldest person alive in Mecca at the time. Abu Umayyah ibn al-Mughira was the oldest person alive. He said, there will be no bloodshed. We're not going to fight over this. Let us just give it over to the first person who enters from uh, the door. There was one major door. Uh, the, the one major area we can say. They didn't have a physical door. One area that you would come in when you would do tawaf. Whoever enters the first, he will be his decision. Now, what this basically meant for them was is the luck of the draw. It's lottery system. Whoever walked in, who would he vote for, for his own tribe? Right? That was the mentality that they had. That whoever walked in would obviously choose his own tribe. So we leave it to the luck of the draw. Whoever walks in, whatever tribe he belongs to will basically win. That was the understanding. Because nobody would ever choose somebody else's tribe. It's just humanly impossible for them to think like that. So, the, what they did was they then said whoever walks in, and you all know the story that our Prophet ﷺ walked in. And what is amazing, as Ibn Ishaq and others mentioned, all the tribes became happy. Because otherwise it would not have been possible for all the tribes to be happy. Only the tribe that that person belonged to would have been happy. But when they saw the Prophet ﷺ, they all became happy because every tribe thought, the Prophet ﷺ likes me so much, he's actually going to choose my tribe. And this is amazing that even the Banu Makhzum, and the Banu Abd dar and the, uh, the, Banu, the other Banus of the Quraysh, they felt such a liking for this person and they felt they, he liked them so much that he's going to choose us. And so they all were overjoyed. And this is an amazing phenomenon that even the people who were not Banu Hashim, Banu Abd dar they felt that he's going to choose them. And subhanAllah, 50 years later, fast forward, you have, uh, uh, you have Amr, uh, Amr ibn al-As say that famous hadith that the Prophet ﷺ was so gentle and nice to me that I knew he loved me the most out of everybody. Even though Amr ibn As is not in the top 10, right? And so one day I asked the Prophet ﷺ, who do you love the most? So he said instantaneously, Aisha. He was not embarrassed to admit he loved his wife the most. And so he must said, no, I meant amongst the men, who do you love? <laughs> so he said, her father, Abuha. So he was, and he linked it back to Aisha. Then he was quiet, he goes, okay, after him. So he said, Umar, kept on asking until finally he got the point. And he stopped asking. But what does this show? Amr, by the way, Amr embraced Islam in the eighth year of the Hijrah. How could he be to the level of Abu Bakr and Uthman and Ali and Umar? You know, it's not even possible. Point being, he is a late convert, but he thinks the Prophet loves me the most. What does that show about how he's dealing with people, right? That every person thinks, I am the most special to him. Isn't that amazing? And even in the days of Jahiliyyah, the exact same thing. That every tribe is thinking, he, they like, he likes me the most. He's going to choose my tribe. And so, as you all know the story, the Prophet ﷺ instantaneously, he said, bring me a, a sheet, bring me a, a, an izar, an upper garment. When it was brought, uh, the Prophet ﷺ himself put it on the izar, put it on the garment, and he said, let every sub-tribe send its representative, send its chieftain, send your guy, and all of us will put it simultaneously. And so they all lifted it, so the Banu Makhzum 
they fulfilled their promise because they were a part of those who lifted. So they didn't break their promise of fighting to the death, they fulfilled it. And all the tribes fulfilled it. And as you know, the Prophet himself was the one who put it uh, into that particular location. Now, they changed the structure of the Kaaba, and Allah had willed that that change would become permanent. Two things they changed. Well, three things actually. Four actually, excuse me. <laughs> Keeps on coming to my mind. Number one, they did. Number one, and the biggest and the most drastic change, either the marble or the wood, we don't know which, but they didn't have enough because they, they were using that expensive material for the foundation. And for the top, they were using the regular rocks around Mecca. So they were using the expensive stuff to solidify the foundation so that when the next time the flood comes, it's going to be a solid structure. So they calculated immediately that they could not build the foundation as large as the original Kaaba. The original Kaaba was not a square, it was a rectangle. The original Kaaba at the time of Ibrahim salam, was a rectangle. So the front and the back where the door is now and the back side of the Kaaba were almost double the length of the width. That's how the original Kaaba was. And that's how it was when the Prophet was growing up till he was 35 years old. Now they got all of this material and they did not have that expensive material to build the entire rectangle. So they decided to build a square instead and to mark the other two uh, angles, if you like, or the other two corners with two posts and to put a little barrier over there, which is, as you know, to this day. Now, perhaps the mentality was, this is what we can afford. Maybe in 100 or 200 years when it's rebuilt, they can have enough money to build the original structure, right? It was not their desire to make it permanent. They realized that this is what we're doing. Maybe the next time it's rebuilt, they can rebuild it from the proper, uh, the proper uh, uh, corners as it was. That's the first change that they did. The second change that they did, the Kaaba was not as high as it became. Of course, now it is even much higher than it used to be. Much higher than it used to be. Uh, they, the, according to one report, the Kaaba at the time of uh, the Prophet's early life was as high as when you sit on a camel. So... Yeah, and it may be uh, up until where the, our thing is over here. Maybe around there, okay? Around maybe, what, 15 feet? Hmm? Something like that, right? It was doubled in height. Now, of course, in our times, it probably goes 50, 100 feet, or I don't know, 70 feet, I think. Pretty high. It's very high when you look at it. But in the time of the Prophet it was pretty small. It was just a long square structure. So they doubled it in height. That was the second change that they did. And so that began the concept of making it very tall. And to this day, it is a very tall structure. The third thing that they did was they made the door of the Kaaba. This is the Banu Abdi Manaf did this, the Prophet Salaam sub-tribe. They made the door of the Kaaba in the middle of the, of the, of the wall. Not on the ground where people could go in. Because... They wanted to be elite and have access to who can go in and who cannot go in. So because they're building that section, they did something that was not done before. And that is they made the door high. And so they have the keys and they have the ladder and only those whom the, the Abdul Manaf, the Banu Abdul Manaf approved, they can go into the Kaaba. And to this day, the door is high because of that. And then they did something which was very logical and rational and, and very common sense. They built a water spout. Because what happened before? The roof caved in because of? The water. Too much rain and flood. So they built a water spout. And to this day we have that water spout that we see. Uh, the concept came from them. And of course not the same water spout. The concept came from them. The Prophet ﷺ, when he conquered Mecca, 20 years after this incident, when he conquered Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ said to Aisha, were it not for the fact that your people are still new to Islam, I would have destroyed this structure of the Kaaba and rebuilt it on the original pillars of Ibrahim and made the door accessible to everybody. But if I were to do this basically, uh, the people would feel, the people would feel uh, awkward because they're new to Islam. Right? So if I were to do this, I mean if I wanted to, I could, but I, I don't want to do it to cause problems to the new Muslims. Now, 
This hadith is a well-known hadith that's reported in Sahih Bukhari. In the time of the early Umayyad dynasty, what happened was, there was a lot of civil war going on, and one group led by Abdullah ibn Zubayr, the companion, broke away from the Umayyad empire, and they founded their own mini caliphate in Mecca. Abdullah ibn Zubayr founded his own mini caliphate in Mecca. And this was at the time of the infamous Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, the most tyrant ruler that the Ummah has ever seen. You think today's rulers are bad? Listen to what these guys did. You know, amazing stuff. Uh, so that was during the time of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. So Abdullah ibn Zubayr took over the Kaaba, and he was a pious. Uh, he was a pious Sahabi. He was a companion. And so when this hadith reached him, he destroyed the Kaaba, and he rebuilt it like a rectangle, and he made the door back down to the earth. So he followed the hadith of the Prophet Then Hajjaj ibn Yusuf overtook Mecca again by throwing catapults into the Kaaba. And the catapults destroyed the Kaaba itself. Amazing. You think the people in Syria and Lebanon and whatnot are bad? This guy attacked the Kaaba. And he destroyed the Kaaba because he wanted to get to Abdullah ibn Zubayr. And then he crucified Abdul, literally crucified on a plank in front of the Kaaba, Abdullah ibn Zubair. And this is a companion, and the son of a companion, and the brother of a companion, and the son of a female companion. Both his parents were companions. This is, this is Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. He's literally a mental case. Nonetheless, the point being, he had to rebuild the Kaaba, and he didn't want to rebuild it the way that Ibn Zubair rebuilt it. So he destroyed it again. And he built it the way that the Jahili Arabs had built it. The square with the Hatim, with the door high up. And then it is reported that in the time of Imam Malik, the uh, Khalifa at the time said to Imam Malik, why don't we go back and build it the way that Ibn Zubair did it? Because isn't that what the Prophet wanted? Imam Malik said, no, I don't want the Kaaba to become a toy that kings come along and they put their whims and desires on it. And this is what you call fiqh. This is what you call understanding. No, because this already happened to me, just leave it now. And so from the time of uh, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, it has remained upon the foundations of the uh, Jahili Arabs, and the Hatim has been there, uh, and, and the, 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 the door has been uh, above this. Now, a number of benefits that we derive, and then inshallah we uh, have some slides. We have some slides to show inshallah. Yeah. Uh, notice how everything is planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Arabs are in the desert, they have no fancy wood, they have no marble, they have nothing of this nature, and yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends to them the most choicest material from the palace of the Caesar. This is the most powerful man on earth, financing what he thinks is the building of a church. وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهَ And that material, with that craftsman, came to the lands of Arabia to Mecca, and that structure